Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Geoscience Australia Wednesday seminar for this week. Uh, for those of you online and anyone here who doesn't know me, my name's James Johnson. I'm the CEO here at Geoscience Australia, and I'm excited about today's uh, panel discussion. It's going to be a good one. Um, first of all, I'd just like to, on behalf of Geoscience Australia, acknowledge that this meeting, this webinar, is taking place on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and uh, extend that respect to any First Nations people here with us today. Um, welcome to a very special Wednesday seminar celebrating GIS Day 2023. It's a day that highlights the many ways that geographic information systems advance our ability to understand Earth's complex and interconnected systems. It's also special because it's going to be presented by this wonderful panel of eminent geospatial, uh, geospatial uh, officials from a number of uh, jurisdictions around the country. They're here to discuss the exciting prospects, the challenges and the collaborative opportunities that lie ahead for GIS in Australia. And I'm very pleased that Geoscience Australia is hosting this GIS Day Leadership Forum, Mapping Our Future Together. In this uh, informative webinar, we're going to delve into the innovative applications of GIS technology, address pressing issues and discuss how we can collectively chart the course to a geospatially empowered future for our nation. The event offers, offers you the opportunity to join in, to interact with the panel through an open Q&A session. So I invite you to join this dynamic dialogue if you're online and also obviously here in the room and help us shape the geospatial landscape in Australia, enhancing the decision making addressing complex challenges and propelling our nation towards a brighter geospatial future. I'd now like to introduce the panel chair uh, for today's forum, Melissa Harris, PSM, uh, Chief Executive of, the, of Land Use Victoria and thereby Registrar of Titles and Register of Water in Victoria. As well as uh, managing the Victorian Land Registry, Mel has uh, led major digital transformation projects including the Digital Cadastre Modernisation and Digital Twin Victoria. She made history in 2021 by becoming the first female chair of the Australia New Zealand Land Information Council, or ANSLIC. And so with that, I'll now hand over to Mel to introduce the panel. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Thank you so much, James. Um, hello, everyone. It's absolutely fantastic to be here. Um, this is my first time here in about five years, believe it or not, um, for the ANSLIC meeting and so fabulous to be doing that on GIS Day and to have this opportunity to uh, to lead this webinar and really dig into all of the fabulous things that are happening in the GIS world in Australia. Um, so I'll introduce what this esteemed panel of um, GIS royalty to you shortly. But just to set the scene, um, I just wanted to comment on what an incredibly, um, from my perspective, remarkable um, few years it has been for GIS in Australia and all over the world. We've seen um, the advent of 3D, of machine learning, uh, of IoT, of cloud-based GIS, um, and all of that is unlocking um, an incredible array of exciting new capabilities for governments and communities everywhere. And of course, we've seen firsthand how all of um, some of these emerging capabilities have guided humanity's responses to some of these incredibly pressing recent events, whether it be COVID, um, the, the challenges of climate change, some of the regional conflicts, um, and of course, um, in Australia's case, you know, whether it be floods or fire, our emergency response. Um, and so happily, because of the sort of renewed appreciation for the strategic advantage this technology um, can provide. We've seen significant investment um, by various governments in GIS programs. And I'm going to put to our panel members that I think we really are in a golden age of GIS technology in Australia and perhaps against across the world. So to hear more about this and more, I'll just like to introduce our fabulous panel members. Firstly, someone who I'm sure for the crew today needs no introduction, Lisa Bush, who's the Head of Geoscience Australia's National Location Information Branch, 
um, 25 years of experience in geospatial intelligence, leadership, policy and strategy, and currently leading such important efforts to enhance our nation's geospatial capabilities, including through such things as digital apps and Australia. So welcome, Lisa. Um, Craig Sandy. Craig will be known um, to many of you. He's been in the industry for a long, long time. He's currently the Surveyor General of Victoria. We're very lucky to have him in Victoria. He's the Chair of the Surveyors Registration Board in Victoria, and he's currently the Chair of the Intergovernmental Committee on Surveying and Mapping, which do such important work um, across Australia and New Zealand supporting Ansley. Welcome, Craig. Uh, Narelle Underwood. Uh, Narelle is the Surveyor General of New South Wales. We've got two generals in the room. Um, and also the Executive Director of uh, Spatial Services. She's President of the Board of Surveying and Spatial Information, <coughs> Chair of the Geographic, Geographical Names Board in New South Wales, and New South Wales Representative on Ansley and has multiple pivotal roles in surveying and spatial information governance uh, right across uh, New South Wales and Australia. So welcome to the and last but definitely not least is my fabulous um, Deputy Chair of ANSLIC, Sandy Carruthers. Sandy is the Executive Director of Strategy and Science for the South Australian Department of Environment and Water and, the, and as I mentioned, my um, trusty co-chair. She has 30 years experience applying geospatial technology to support government decision making um, in a whole range of different sessions. So welcome Sandy. So aren't we lucky um, to be able to share the insights and, and wisdom of these fabulous people as part of today's panel. So to kick things off and get you all in the zone, I thought we'd start, start with a bit of a fun question, which is and in no particular order, so you can, um, whoever wants to grab this one first can, but in no more than a minute, um, can each of the panel members tell us about the first map you ever or if you can't think about that, um, tell us about your favourite map and what's so special. So, one minute each. Who's going to go first? Let everybody jump in. Hopefully the microphone's working. Um, first map I made, I can't really remember, but I remember drawing ma um, maps of my neighbourhood as a kid and um, being annoyed that I couldn't quite get the scale right. Um, but I think Favourite maps, most people will know I'm a huge Lego nerd, so I'm going to say my favourite maps are actually my Lego world map that sits on my wall at home or the Lego globe. Uh, the first map I think I actually made was in my honours, which is a little bit sad that it was so late, uh, but I actually had to hand map um, a veg vegetation map. My honours was on vegetation, so there was no GIS then, and it sort of... I'm so happy that GIS turned up soon after that because it was a really terrible experience and it was a terrible map, I think. Yeah. It was hand coloured with pen, yeah, Derwent's, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Thank you, go Craig. Uh, I think my first map was probably hand drawn at uni and I'm sure it was horrendous because my hand drawing wasn't good, but one of the ones that I find most interesting uh, as a sporting person uh, I saw a, a map that was created which was a ratio of medals to population by country uh, and it just demonstrates the, the, that some of the smaller countries actually in terms of ratio far outstrip the larger countries like Australia and the US and, and I just find those sorts of ratio maps really uh, interesting because they don't actually rely on the geographic shape that we expect to see so yeah, interesting. Thank you. Um, when I was little, my uh, parents had an earth moving uh, business. And so for as long as I can remember, I've been poring over topographic uh, maps. And I reckon I've been running uh, the end of a, a level since I was about five years old. And I think uh, poring over those maps um, when I was really young is, is um, what ignited my, my love in maps. My, um, and because of that, I guess I've been creating maps for as long as I can legitimately remember. And so my first maps were around my house making treasure maps. Uh, for my uh, kid brothers um, and, and sisters, and I confess that I still do it now for my kids with X marks the spot. Uh, so my first maps were of home with treasure. Fantastic. The old treasure, but very underrated. I think it could be an idea there. So thank you for sharing. That was some fantastic examples. And look out 
with all diverse applications of, of maps. Um, and so thank you for sharing those insights. I wish I could hear more from the audience, but we'll have to save that for another time. All right, first question. I hope that audio is working okay. There's a few questions um, coming through. Can you just use the handheld mics? Um, this is a low key. Okay. okay. Hopefully that's better, <laughs> no worries. All right, so first question. Um, so this is for Narelle and Craig. So you've both had very long and distinguished careers. Craig, perhaps a touch longer than Narelle's, but still very long and distinguished in this industry. Um, and I imagine over that time, you've witnessed incredible changes in GIS capability um, and applications. So if you could just tell us a bit about what some of the things you've witnessed over your career and what excites you most about the future. Wow. Um, yeah, I try to think I'm still young at heart, but I, I do recall hearing and, and talking to people that, that produced their first maps using command line in DOS and various other technologies that many of the younger generation probably don't even exist. And I recall I was working in a surveying company in, in North New South Wales, when, sorry, in, in Northern Queensland, where we, we started to use the internet. And, and you know that was in the late 90s and now we, we rely on that every day and if we don't have it you know people start getting upset and I've, I've actually used the slide that Wi-Fi is the new air and and predominantly it is and and so when you think about where we are now uh, our, our mapping relies on having access to that information we have the ability to get data and, and services from the various agencies and bring them together to make some things and some of the stuff that I've used from Geoscience Australia for instance in relation to uh, mapping of the, the tidal flows and things, absolutely astounding that we can do that now uh, where in the past that was all static. So going from basically single line entry into DOS to where you can pretty much go and get anything you want in real time almost and put it together, absolutely astounding. You know, from moving in from, you know, GIS being a piece of software sitting on a desktop where, you know, you wanted to move information around. It was hard drives. I remember USB sticks coming out when I first started uni and being super excited about not having to save things onto CDs and floppy disks and stuff like that. Um, into the world where you are consuming live data feeds um, as well as your own local data, as well as data from other people. Um, and being able to do the analysis and create the stories to share that data to drive decision making, I think is a big um, aspect. It's also the integration. GIS is no longer a standalone piece of software. It integrates with our everyday CAD software, our surveying software. It integrates and in, can be embedded into websites and pages. It can be embedded into Excel spreadsheets and the like now. So it is that interoperability between all of those different pieces of software and tools that we have at our beck and call. And I think the biggest thing is it's not something that um, you know, surveying and spatial geeks use, it's every day. Everybody is using some form of mapping and GIS on their handheld device. They're using those insights that we're deriving from it in making decisions and it's ubiquitous. It's just happening in the background. It's part of our life. Um, there was a story on the radio this morning about um, the potential for solar flares and it taking out uh, the internet or GPS and everyone's like, oh my God, how am I going to navigate somewhere? Um, we've just gotten so used to being able to utilise that technology and so it's, you know, that's I think one of the most exciting parts is it is just part of everyday common language now. Yeah, thanks for those reflections. I mean, it is pretty extraordinary, isn't it, when you think, I mean, I think about navigating my way around Melbourne with a street directory. I think I'd be a, um, a traffic hazard if I did that these days. Um, and it is, it's become so ubiquitous. Um, and the thing I love about it is that it's re the role it's increasingly playing in democratising data and just putting huge amounts of data in the hands of every, every, everyone who needs it. So thank you for those insights. Um, so Sandy and Lisa, this one's for you. So what big changes are you seeing in the way GIS is being used to make a major difference to real world outcomes? Um, so in areas such as environmental management or climate resilience, emergency response, so how, what are those, some of those 
really high value use cases or applications where you're seeing some a real uplifting capability. Uh, thanks. So I guess if we get back to basics in the first instance, when we're uh, applying geospatial capability, what we're really trying to do is achieve that decision advantage, to be able to make decisions more effectively, more efficiently, more holistically. Uh, and when we look at current applic applications of achieving that uh, decision advantage, uh, I guess a couple of key areas uh, for me that I'm really seeing is that we are no longer constrained by technology that we have the technology to integrate a whole range of different data uh, and services, and that is a massive difference because in the past it has been tech that has been constraining. Now it's all those other bits and pieces. It's our leadership, it's our uh, data standards, it's um, how our data sharing agreements, it's a, it's a whole range of um, enablers that is restricting us rather than the actual, uh, in most instances, uh, technology. So I think uh, a, a massive, change in the first instances is where we're at from a uh, technology point of view and uh, being able to explore the art of the possible. And I guess another great shift that we're seeing is moving from uh, data to what's often termed as decision-ready data, so services, being able to re or, uh, interact uh, with, the, um, with the information that's being provided, getting as far up that knowledge triangle as possible to get as much value extraction uh, from whatever's being collected. We don't want to see things in uh, spreadsheets. We don't want to see things in PDF. We want to see those fused with multiple different types of data and interact with those to make decisions um, in as close to near real time often um, as possible. Uh, so I guess there are two key developments that I see, but the application across that is far and wide. Um, we hear a lot about that in the emergency management uh, community at multiple different levels. So whether that's at federal government uh, all the way down uh, to the local application um, of that. But I guess uh, one of the great uh, privileges and challenges of my position here um, in, at the national level is seeing that that is actually, uh, there is use cases all across the nation and, and you know, I can point hundreds of them um, at federal government and that's times by a lot uh, when we look at the um, Australian uh, context. Uh, in federal government, I'm most excited about enabling data sets that currently are not uh, remotely close to being geospatially enabled um, at all to make more uh, uh, location-based decision-making. So at the federal level, uh, being able to assist different uh, um, uh, data creators um, or different agencies to be able to geospatially enable their data sets and allow them to excel at their core business and then fuse that with data from other areas. So as an example, uh, Geoscience Australia is excellent at our core business and we concentrate on that. Australian Bureau of Statistics is excellent at their core business and they concentrate on that. Department of Social Services is excellent at their core business and they con um, concentrate on that. And then you fuse all those services together and then that's when the magic happens. No longer does ABS have to worry about um, border information or roads information or vegetation information um, or the application of uh, different types of grants information. They're worrying about their population demographic information. Department of Social Security, um, sorry, Social Services, for example, is concentrating on their core business and making sure that is excellent and they don't have to worry about roads information, about vegetation information or whatnot. You let everyone be excellent at that core business and it makes us, enables us to make really informed decision makings far more effectively and efficiently and holistically than we've ever been able to do before. And I think that's what I'm seeing at our level um, and that's what's most exciting for us. Thanks, Lisa. And I, this is probably a good segue from that. I thought I might give a couple of examples, given I work in an environment agency and we're using all of the things that Lisa talked about. So just a, a, a good example is imagery. So imagery has always been there, but it's always been never at the right time. We've never been able to use enough of it, never at the right detail. But now in the last probably year or two, that's all completely changed. So um, one example is the, the IC um, satellite services. So we just use that in the latest floods that, that happened in South Australia. So the floods came across the border around Christmas time. We had major flooding of a lot of infrastructure and property and towns. We had our own we had our own mapping that sort of predicted where we knew the flooding would come. But the IC satellite actually told us exactly when the inundation was happening, and we were able to use that to give people proper warning and know what was coming, and also validate our models. And that actually you know that saves property and, and lives. Um, another really good example is um, um, black. Uh, black sky so that's a satellite on, on demand so um, we we are using them we're tasking them so we can task them to fly a satellite in 90 minutes they can turn around an image so we're currently using that for our prescribed burning and for our illegal vegetation clearance but we know when a fire comes we'll be able to actually task them to fly 
um, as the fire, the fire front's burning, along with some of the, the icy work as well. And what that means is we would normally hire a plane. They would go up, they would fly a, a day later, we would get the imagery and we would then process it and turn it around. That's really slow. This actually means that we're actually getting close to real-time data informing what's happening on a fire front, which actually saves lives. And it also means we can um, do a better job of actually giving information in terms of saving some of our conservation assets as well. Um, and another example um, at the sort of ecology end is, I talked at the beginning, I laughed about how I did my vegetation map by hand. Um, most of Australia's vegetation maps are actually do, are polygon uh, hand mapped by experts. Um, we're now moving to creating a digital version of that. So we're taking LIDAR imagery, the hand mapping that we've done, all the species data, all the sort of national data we have um, at a state level to produce new maps that are ecosystem maps. And, and the value of them is that they are, they're, more, they're more detailed. We can tailor them to different species or different ecosystems. And when, with climate change, we can actually then do much better predictions of what, what may or may not happen to them. We can use it in, in fire, so uh, uh, doing prescribed burning, getting things um, burnt the right way in fire, for fire uh, modelling and all, the, there's, there's sort of so many applications for that and that's only just become possible literally in the last almost two years because we can now, and the other thing, and we can talk about this a bit later, is that it's now in the hands of non-GIS people, which is so fantastic because it means the cohort of people now using spatial data has just kind of blossomed and it means they'll be in, our, in the tent with us as well, which makes it easy for us to do our jobs and to sort of promote the, 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 how valuable spatial data is along with all the other data. Yes, some brilliant examples there. And isn't that incredible? In just the last couple of years, um, that's been the case. And contrast that to the way we used to do things and what an incredibly vital capability that is with, in terms of battling some of the increasing challenges around climate risk and among many other things. So thank you for that. And so um, looking at where Australia's at and at some of the experiences that we're all now getting in in dealing with these capabilities. Uh, do you think we're doing enough um, to ensure that we've got the best geospatial capability that we need? And what do you think we're really good at? And um, what do you think we're missing? Um, and Lisa, I'm looking at you. Uh, excellent. I think what, what we're good at um, is intent. We have a lot of uh, exceptional operators uh, all over Australia, whether it's in government, industry, community, or academia, and they all, uh, whether they're geospatial professionals or they're dabbling around the edges, they all want to get on uh, and do their job and, and do their job well. And there's an excellent example of some of the advances that have been uh, made over the last uh, couple of years. Um, and uh, I draw our attention at the national level to some of the work that's been done on, for example, the Positioning um, Australia work, uh, and, and there's a whole heap of other um, initiatives that are sitting out there. But I think some of the challenges uh, that we have is really clear roles and responsibilities um, across Australia about who is, who is responsible for what in this ecosystem that we, that we have that, is, uh, that has happened, um, not out of design, it's, it's just um, made an appearance over the last hundred or, or in fact the last couple of hundred uh, years. It hasn't been designed um, to be as optimal as it potentially uh, could be. And there's examples of excellent work, but I would say a key deficiency at the moment is really clear roles and responsibilities um, about who needs to uh, create and produce different types of data and how to share that to be able to enable that one geography from the national level all the way down uh, to, the, to the street level so that we're all using the same data source and we're not all paying for it multiple times over in, in whatever uh, way that you need to pay for it. So whether it's actually coin or duplication of um, effort because your team's going and creating something that's been created 15 times or 150 times um, over. So for me, um, some deficiencies that I'd love to, to help address is those really clear roles uh, and responsibilities. And then in line with that is making sure uh, that we are resourced, that, that whoever has that responsibility has the resources to get after that in a sustainable way. So we're not on um, you know, a 12, 24 month cycle of trying to get the, the next um, finances to be able to take that next step forward that to have a sustainable uh, lookout ideally in like a 10 year rolling window so that we can plan accordingly and make sure we legitimately get best bang for buck um, for all our geospatial uh, data and services across the nation. Uh, so I, I agree with Lisa. Uh, 
so we, we have some amazing professionals who love what they do. Where we've struggled is national collaboration. It's working together across the jurisdictions to help each other. And I, I think we're getting so much better that, than that, at that now. And, you know, we're sitting in, uh, in ICSM two weeks ago. We're in Anslick today. And when you hear jurisdictions get up and say, well, we used what New South Wales and Victoria did, or we used what Western Australia did, and we've built on that, and you see those jurisdictions going, great, we can now apply what you've done. So you're starting to see this, someone does something and the next person takes the next leap of faith. It's this leap of everyone using everyone's capabilities and what they've learned to produce something that's better for all of us. And I think that's where we're starting to get a whole lot better than what we've been. I think it's one of my favourite things about the GIS community. They're just such generous sharers of knowledge and wisdom and they're so um, motivated by the sort of higher purpose and common good. And I, I know for people who've only ever been in this industry, you probably think, well, is there another way? But it really is something I think that sets uh, this community apart. So, um, yeah, some fabulous insights. So if, imagine if you could take all that we've achieved with the challenges we currently have with good sort of national funding and cohesion and strategic focus. Um, yeah, the mind boggles what, what, what we could do. Um, now, thank you to our people that are online. We've got about 130 people online, which is fantastic. Um, there's a few questions there, but it would be good to have more. Now, I'm going to ask my next question, but um, for those of you who are wanting to ask the panel a question, now would be a good time to pop them in the chat. Um, so, Narelle and Sandy, um, turning to the workforce of the future, um, as you know, we have a diversity problem and we don't have enough skilled professionals to service our requirements into the future. Uh, what do you think? Do, you, do we have an image problem? And what do you think are our biggest challenges that we need to overcome to build the workforce of the future? Um, yep, uh, we definitely have an image problem. Um, and, and it works twofold. So most people don't understand geospatial and surveying. Um, so making sure that we're out there promoting. So one of the things that we do really well is amazing work for the community. What we absolutely suck at is promoting what we do to the community. Um, it's become so ubiquitous that people don't realise that they're um, benefiting from the work that all of our agencies do. Um, the other challenge is, is that because so many people use the technology now that you don't need a specialised degree to be able to use GIS, the majority of people who are using the technology don't identify themselves as being part of our community. They're an architect who uses GIS or surveying equipment. They're an engineer who uses our data. They're a, a planner who uses the data. And so we've got a whole range of people out there who are in what we would class as our community who don't identify as that. And so how do we shift that so that people can see the connection between what we do and what they do and that it's not the old school at 10 paces, you're st stepping on my toes, this is our patch, we do this. How do we collaborate together as aligned professionals to drive those better outcomes and support um, the future moving, um, the future workforce and um, building those skills? Um, we also need to acknowledge that you know, not everybody's going to go to university and do a three or four year degree. And so how do we upskill our current workforce with micro-credentials? How do we attract new talent through traineeships and the like and quickly upskill so people can learn on the job? Because that's what people want to do. They don't want to go away and do a three year degree and then get a job that, you know, when most entry level positions also require three years experience. So we need to think about how we market. Um, and what can people learn on the job through on-job training um, as well as being supported through formal training um, and investing so from primary school level about the importance of mapping. Like most kids study geography, um, I, you know, during COVID homeschooling, I got the fun job of teaching my son's first geography lessons. We got to play around on Google Map and I'm like, dude, this is what I do for a job every day. And he's like, oh, this is really cool. Like hadn't ever clicked that linking those things together. And so how do we do that so that every kid understands that there's a career and opportunities behind the things that they think are just cool tech? So, oh, that, that was great, Narua. For maybe just to, I'll just maybe add a few things around, I think you're right, around the collaboration. So people don't really care about the label, they care about the outcome. So if you've got 
all the right people in the room using and GIS is just one of those things that people use. I think that's how you get people coming in and then they're, they're your biggest advocates and they're the ones actually asking for funding for you to get the data so you can help them do their thing. And you see that happening a lot. Um, and I, the other thing is around thinking about thinking about what, what all of us do as a capability rather than it having a particular label. So what are the capabilities that we need to get the work done and then bringing, bringing those different capabilities together and sort of identifying that. And I guess when I started, I was reflecting, um, there was probably, I don't know, 15 of us. We were all under 30, including the two managers. That, and that's when GIS first started. And it was just like a group of kids in the room, really. Um, but we don't. Well, we just don't have those young people starting at work. So all of us are, are now in our forties and fifties, and where are all those younger people that need to be coming through with new ideas and kind of with all the new stuff that they're doing at uni? Like I, I don't know what other states are like, but we certainly are missing that that graduate cohort. And we really need to, I think, think be thinking about how we either bring them in and how all of us bring them in across across the board, because it's really important. I think that's really important to, to have those younger people coming through. And I know that they must be somewhere, but they're just not with us. Some fantastic insights there. Um, I will just I've got some questions here, which I'll share shortly. Just say um, a bit of support for uh, the comments you made, Narelle, um, around uh, you know how we engage and recognise the sort of broader application and value of what we do. And Lisa, uh, a vote of support for your statement around the fact it's got the technology, it's the enables, and it's just so true, isn't it? It's all it's the money, it's the leadership, it's all of those other things. Um, but we've got a question here. Actually, Mary's question is fantastic, but I might save it till last. Um, we've got a question here. The acronym of GIS started with Geographic Information Systems. In recent years, in some contexts, it is referred to as Geospatial Information System. Um, so, so there's Geographical Information System. In recent years, Geospatial Information System. Wondering whether Nowadays, it can reflect all potentials of geospatial systems. Is it not the time to brainstorm a new term like, wait for it, geospatial informed decision making system, that's a mouthful, or a shorter name like the Geoverse? What do you think? My mind can think of a whole range of versions to that. Um, yeah. I mean, I was going to comment on the previous one where, where Narelle said we sucked at our, our promotion. That the reality is that every person, just about every day, uses something that we've created. Through their phones, they've got positioning systems, they've got addressing, they've got mapping. They use it to get around. They use it to take kids to school. They use it every day. They just don't know they're using it. So we've been really successful in enabling our community, but we've been really bad at telling them that it was us that did it. Uh, so in terms of the terminologies, you know, geospatial, if people relate to that or if they relate to geography, does it really matter? Uh, I mean, when we say GIS, most people's eyes glaze over. So, you know, it's really a matter of finding a term that the community relates to and then us adopting that so that when we talk about it, they know what we're talking about. Internally, we can use all our words and we'll, we'll always understand each other. But to me, the most important is what does the community want to embrace? Names, names, names. names. Um, it's chair of place names. Um, <laughs> the names we attach to things are really important, but you can debate end on end around uh, what names should be attached to what pieces of technology. I think the, the important thing is, while it is GIS day, GIS is a technology if we're talking about the outcomes, and I think that's what's really important, is what are the, what are the outcomes that geospatial, geo anything um, is driving? And so, you know, bringing that to the forefront so that people, you know, attach it to it. I mean, we go out west when we're doing imagery capture or surveying, and people still refer to spatial services as the central mapping authority. Like we haven't been known by that name by like over 30 years. Um, but that's what people still hold on to because to them, you're the guys that produce topographic maps, whether that's a digital topographic map or a one that I've still gone and bought from the news agency and, and wanted a hard copy. It is about maps. People understand maps. I often say to people like we're the government version of Google Maps. 
although I did have a meeting with Google Maps uh, last week about the fact that they utilise all our data and how it'd be great to have a statement from Google talking about the importance of the authoritative data that they then build their maps on. So yeah, happy to have conversations about what that is. I go with that, you know, we'd need the branding and marketing people to understand what people outside of our community actually relate with. I, I couldn't agree more. I'm not an educator and I'm not a uh, marketing expert, so I, I'm quite happy to be um, uh, part of the conversation about what that terminology is, but I'm all about the outcome. So um, making, making it a compelling uh, and relatable uh, narrative um, with our stakeholders at a whole range of different levels um, and whether that's uh, you know a user in a community group or in a school um, or at university or it's with different levels of uh, government or within the industry it's all about the end state so I'm very happy to be guided on that narrative and um, and I will apply it willingly and with love. I just add that Geoverse might work with the primary school kids it sounds pretty cool <laughs> it's a bit, a bit kind of superhero might lose the older generation. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And isn't that interesting? So it's that challenge to be relevant, but without being too novel and, and gimmicky. Um, and look, there's an interesting chat here emerging, which I won't share in complete detail, but it's this relationship between geospatial and tech. So someone's making the point that industry needs to stop dumping GIS in the IT department. Absolutely right, 100%. Um, but that young people are being drawn into tech rather than spatial, and isn't it a shame they don't realise that how you know technology, what incredible technology is behind the geospatial um, you know industry? Um, so you don't need to comment on that. I'm just sharing the sharing the reflections. Um, a couple of um, there's one here from someone who's doing a bachelor's degree in GIS hasn't made it to an interview when applying for entry level GIS roles. Um, do you think sometimes we know in principle what we need to do, but we don't? We have struggled. We struggle to put it into practice. What do you think? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, from from both the side of the applicant applying for a role. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that we can do to help applicants understand what it is that we're looking for. Um, but also from a government perspective, we often get cornered into how a government advertisement needs to be and the words that we're allowed to use. Um, and so, you know, how do we break that down so that it is attractive to a broader audience? But uh, I think I raised it before, you know, expecting someone to have three years experience at an entry level, like we've got to break that down. We've got to break that cycle and be realistic about if we've got a skill shortage, what we need to be doing is attracting the right talent. Um, and people can be taught it's about the cultural fit and about um, their willingness to bring those diverse ideas to challenge what we're doing in an organisation um, to, to take us to that future level, that level of innovation that you're talking about um, and really having that agile or like a startup mindset to what we can achieve in the process for it. Um, but I think, yeah, there's a real role for industry to play in helping people prepare for interviews um, in that aspect of what things that we're actually looking for when we're advertising for those roles. I just I agree. It's about reasonable expectations, not um, un unreasonable ones. It's graduates are, are sort of like a, a, an open book, and they're ready to be trained, and that's that's the great thing about them. We shouldn't expect them to be experts. All right. So that might be our first call to action, everyone. Um, you know, spare a thought for our emerging um, professionals, and and think about what you can do to embrace them and accelerate their career, if you get the chance. Um, now this one I would give a thumbs up to if I could, but I'm not sure whose machine this is. Um, but I, it's a question, it's a statement that um, Australia needs to have a national geospatial country level action plan, uh, bringing in governments, academia and the private sector civil, and civil society similar to other countries based on the UN integrated geospatial information framework, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Germany has led this effort in Europe. What do you think? Is this something um, that's missing in Australia? <laughs> Bit of a loaded question. Come the mic just instantly goes to Lisa. <laughs> I am. All right. Uh, so a couple of points. Um, a couple of points in there. So first of all, there was a reference to IGIF, the Integrated Geospatial uh, 
uh, information framework um, and really it's our nine strategic pathways and a process to be able to develop uh, a geospatial capability holistic of all of its enablers including mapping out things like benefits and workforce and innovation and a whole heap of different things developed uh, um, through the United Nations uh, Global Geospatial Information uh, Management uh, uh, Committee of Experts. Uh, that was uh, has been a 12-year, 13-year body of work and it was signed off last year and there is currently seven uh, action uh, plans at the national level in play right now, a number of others under development and also application at lower levels. So a hydrographic one with a particular focus um, on the Pacific uh, and also for uh, different subsections um, of, uh, of a nation, for, a, for example, developing one for climate change um, at the moment. So that is um, a really robust uh, framework that it's been developed with a whole heap of uh, experts um, uh, from over 130 different nations have had inputs to get to this point. So uh, first of all, thumbs up. I, th I think that's a, a really good starting point if you want to be able to map out um, a national level action plan. Uh, what I would say though is an action plan can only be anchored to, it needs to be anchored to strate very clear strategic intent. Um, and associated uh, policy to get you there and potentially legislation um, as well. Uh, and pretty much everyone in this audience has heard me rabbit on about the fine line that we work at the national level in being able to navigate uh, the space between, uh, we don't have, uh, we, we have very limited, uh, very small amounts of legislation around how we create, store, manage, share uh, geospatial data. And we also don't, uh, so that's our sticks and we don't have many of them. Uh, and we have uh, a deficit in, in carrots. We don't have massive bags of cash to say, come along for the journey and do things this way because we're going to pay for it. And so it's really challenging at the, the national level at the moment because uh, you don't have the sticks or the carrots um, to get to where we absolutely uh, need to. Um, and as uh, Sandy, uh, Craig, sorry, <laughs> I've done that many times. Um, uh, yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, that ANSLIC and other bodies are a coalition of the willing. However, uh, when that uh, economic incentive is not there for your state or territory, you're no longer willing for very good reasons. So how do we build out uh, a national plan? So I'm going to summarise back down. Yes, national action plan, but the step before that is understanding what our needs are and developing a robust uh, policy and strategy and as part of that process, examining uh, is there a need um, what, what level of governance do we need? Can we get away with just a strategy with an all-in buy-in? Do we need a policy? Is there a place for legislation? And certainly there is plenty examples um, of all of those different combinations from around the globe. Uh, we're in a very lucky position that we can design this. We can pick and choose what works for the Australian context once we've done our homework and we've got the associated resources to do our collective homework. I don't disagree with any of that. <laughs> what, what I would add is that we still live in a federation. Uh, and so having national plans is a great idea and, and absolutely important. But in a federation, we still operate predominantly as eight different countries. Uh, and so while we can willingly participate in national initiatives, we still have to report back to our state premiers and our state cabinet. And if they say, you've got to go in this direction, we as public servants still have to you know, adhere to what their direction is and support them while at the same time trying to ensure that we operate collaboratively with our state colleagues. So, and, and if you want to find an interesting perspective on this, I'm reading a book called The White Man's Burden. It relates to foreign aid. Classic discussion on this issue exactly. Thank you. One for the reading list. Excellent. Okay, well, I can't let you go today without asking you at least one question on um, the topic of the moment, which is, of course, is digital twins. Um, so there's been incredible rise to prominence in recent years with digital twins, and they mean very different things uh, to different people in some cases, but generally they're a, you know, a, um, a metaphor for innovation in 3D um, mapping capability. So. Um, just quickly, what are your thoughts? Are they a fad? Um, and how do we get to that grand vision of a federated ecosystem of connected digital twins? All right, I'll start because I've got the microwave, microwave, the microphone. Sorry, I'm having a shocker today. Um, yeah. 
Um, so uh, let's start on the fad part first. Uh, I think uh, my answer to that is yes and no. Um, there is uh, a number of, uh, on the yes side, is often I think people don't really understand um, what they're talking about when they're referring to a digital twin, but everyone wants it. It's a little bit like the 3D fly-throughs of 10 years ago. I want one of those because everyone else has got one of those, but not really looking at what my needs are and how that capability can meet their needs. So there is a little bit of fad about that. But also uh, to the point about uh, digital twin is many things to, to many different uh, people. Um, and I think that the concept will continue to um, solidify and, and become clearer for different use groups. And I don't think it's going anywhere. We will just continue to build and build and build um, out what that capability uh, means um, from a national level to states and territories for, you know, the digital twin of the garden out to the side. Um, I mean, it means different things to, to different people. Um, in terms of a digital twin uh, national vision, I'd like to see that vision. Uh, I think there's a lot of people, if we ask everyone in this room and online what their a definition of a digital twin is and what the national vision is, we'd get 100 and however many people you've got online versions of that. Uh, so in the first instance, it'd be really great to be able to uh, corral that together into to one solid narrative. So we've got a collective understanding about uh, what that, that means, in my opinion. Um, definitely agree, digital twin terminology um, is a bit of a buzzword at the moment and people class things as digital twins that probably aren't digital twins. I guess the way I look at it and say is the digital twins, the shiny toy that the minister can talk about what we're actually talking about is a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today in terms of, you know, making sure we've got the right data to drive the right outcomes. And so a digital twin is a way that we can drive data made, data informed decision making. Um, you know, it is about making sure that we've got the right data standards and processes in place. We can, you can dump as much data as you want into a digital twin. Is it actually authoritative? Is it the right data? Is it out of date? Is it, you know, and, and come up with the wrong decisions based on the data going in. So it's not just about the shiny toy that you can do, you know, further analysis on that people can visualise. It's making sure you've got the right UK use cases, the right stories. I feel like at the moment, digital twins are an advancement in technology that are still looking for the right use cases. There's thousands of them and that's part of the problem because it distills the message. Um, and so how do we pick the key things where it is driving clear outcomes for the community in there? Um, but that's part of us is having the narrative. It is about having those discussions with the broader things because it's about us bringing the data, the geospatial data to the table and then working out how it can be applied in those different areas. Um, I think it's still got a long way to go. You know, New South Wales has been on its digital twin journey for about five years now. Um, so, and I would still say we're at a very immature level um, we've still got a long way to go and there's still a lot of work to do in that space. I, just, I was going to add one thing, which is just with the digital twin, I think when you're explain, explaining them to people, um, one of the really good things you get out of it is to say that, that the data that sits under it is so important and all of a sudden the data, the data suddenly becomes useful and, and interesting and people understand why it was so important that it was done to a standard. So it kind of does help to sell the bit underneath um, because often that's the bit that no one wants to pay for or really pay attention to. Yeah, exactly. And there's a very insightful comment here. Every map is a twin of the real world in some way. Uh, digital twins are just the latest version, but they do have excellent branding. And of course, that matters. <laughs> um, is there a national vision, vision for digital twins? There is. If you go to the ANSLIC website, you can see, um, I think it's the principle or guidelines for the spatially enabled digital twins. Pretty timeless piece of work modelled on the um, UK Geospatial Commission's uh, work of a few years ago. So um, if I could put in the chat, I would. Might do it after today. Definitely worth a re read and it has aged well, I'm pleased to say. All right, we're coming to the end, but I've got one more question, if I can find it, which is... Um, mm -mm -mm -mm. What is your, and we might go from one to the other for this last one, what is your geospatial moonshot? Moon, moonshot. What's your big dream for, for geospatial? I guess for me, uh, it goes back to some points I made uh, earlier. Uh, I have, uh, and I think it's probably um, reflected uh, for the whole panel here. We've had the very great pleasure of working with just some in 
incredibly uh, knowledgeable, skilled and experienced uh, geospatial professionals, um, including a whole heap of variants within, within that um, group of people, I guess. And so my, my vision is to be able to better enable them to get on and do their job, I think. Um, and, that, and that sort of reflects on all the different things that we've talked about, really clear roles and responsibilities, really clear funding lines, regardless of whether you're in industry or you're in government or you're in, um, or in academia letting everyone get on and uh, do their business and do it well, uh, but avoiding duplication um, of effort. And I guess that's something at the national level I see a lot of. Um, and in a zero sum resourcing environment, which we are all in one way or another, then surely we wanna make sure that everyone's doing the best they can on their particular part of the puzzle. They know what their part of the puzzle is and they do it well, and then they're leveraging off all the other uh, pieces of the puzzle. So. That's my vision. Um, all of that plus um, <laughs> um, that we as a community, as a, a broader, and that's across all levels, treat data as a valuable asset, just like we treat physical infrastructure as an asset. So that data is recognised and valued as a critical asset. There are parts, pockets of that, but I think just more broadly, um, we always hear in government budgets about the, you know, the investment in physical infrastructure and when that automatically also includes the investment in the digital infrastructure that supports that as well, I think that's my moonshot. Um, so I think at the beginning you said we we're on the cusp of, of um, did you say the golden, the golden age? Of, and I actually think that's probably true. So GIS has been very similar for almost since I started. I think, you know, a few things have changed. but. I can see really big things changing now and becoming really mainstream. So it to be mainstream and part of everything and, and decision making and, and much better decision making and particularly in the environment which is the space I work in is kind of that, that, that will be the ultimate and I can kind of almost see that that's possible now. So I'll build on leases uh, where you know, we're providing the information for people to get on and do their job. So I'm a volunteer firefighter. When I get on the fire truck, I just want to be able to drive down the road and know that there's a hydrant to my left five metres, jump out, put the pipe there and pump water. At this point in time, that's not that simple for us. Uh, on country roads or in the dark, it's not so easy to see all the physical markers. So it's having that ability to help emergency responders and anyone who needs that information to do their job better. So, yep. Brilliant. Um, two minutes to go before I hand back to James. So just quickly, a bit of a plug for a fabulous article I read um, a year or two ago, which is in the Washington Post. We'll put the chat in um, later. But um, its title was, is, it was, the article was reflecting on all of this and the incredible emergence of game-changing capabilities to solve some of the world's most um, intractable problems. Um, and the title of it was, Is the Hero the World's Been Waiting For? Actually a map of sorts. Agree or disagree? Quickly. Just to finish us off. Agree, but the real hero is the person that makes it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, agree, but I'd say it's, it's important that it's got the right data in there so that we're telling an appropriate story. Agree, making sure again that the, the underlying data uh, is an accurate reflection and I wouldn't say it is, it has been for a very long time. Excellent, all right, well I think um, it's going to be hard to beat that as a note to finish up on so let's just give our panellists a round of applause, thank you very much. so much. What a wonderful panel. I think the insights that we've gotten from across the range of jurisdictions, but just the depth of knowledge that was coming out. And I think none of us can be left in any doubt that geospatial information underpins so much of what we do every day. And I absolutely accept that point that most people don't know it. And at one level, that's okay because we're still uh, assisting our fellow citizens. But um, we do need to get those stories out so that there's a greater appreciation of it. It would appear that we need the extra mic. Um, I'm just going to put in a quick plug for next week's seminar. So next week we're going to be uh, having a, a presentation from Cathy Brown and Christo Murray Van Buren on defining Australian stratigraphy, the need for ongoing education and geoscience. So 
just in, in snapshot, defining rock units is a good basic science, enhancing the quality of data available for use in all other geological projects. Many rock units are not defined, and members of the Australian Stratigraphy Commission encourage and educate geologists on how to do this. So I encourage you to come along to that, it should be a really interesting talk. But just to finish, I'd really like to thank our panellists, Lisa, Narell, Sandy, Craig, and our wonderful chair, Mel, who managed to actually guide it deftly without actually having to express any views of her own. So well done, Mel. Um, a big round of applause to thank this fantastic panel.